talk to you about all the darker parts of the internet today, the, the bad actors that are trying to exploit uh, different systems that we create online. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, three different categories of platform exploitation, and then hopefully a little bit of um, a happier note, what we can actually do about that to try to prevent some of this. So I should start by saying I'm a data scientist. So this means that uh, it's a subfield of computer science, but I collect massive amounts of data. This could be images, uh, facts, dates, times, usernames, um, you know, videos, any kind of text, all kinds of data, and then sort, arrange, and ultimately present that in a visual way um, using computer science and uh, statistical techniques so that we can um, learn to solve a problem or understand some kind of social phenomenon. Right now, the stuff that I study is uh, right-wing uh, extremism, far-right, um, racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism, usually uh, behaviors like that, particularly in the online space. So we'll talk today about how bad actors uh, exploit some social media platforms. And we're gonna talk about three different categories. We'll talk about propaganda, We'll talk about financial exploitation, and we'll talk about harassment campaigns. So propaganda first. Um, some of the research questions that I look at in this space are how propaganda spreads online, particularly that REMV or racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism propaganda, um, and whether that differs by format. So does text spread differently than video or audio? Oh, and what are the technical features of the different platforms that encourage the spread of propaganda, this harmful propaganda? Uh, and then we look at strategies, of course, for stopping um, the spread of propaganda in these particular types of campaigns. One of the first projects that I worked on in this space was the um, Christchurch shooter from last year, um, 2019, um, created a video of his crimes and a manifesto and these um, artifacts, the document and the video spread um, throughout the internet. And there was a great deal of work being done by the platform companies to try to remove this content. And so what I did um, in this space was, was track the artifacts as they moved across the internet. So the actual files themselves tried to figure out strategies for um, file removal and then making uh, images um, and maps, if you will, of how the, the manifesto and the video actually moved across the internet. And then wrote an article at the end about talking about how in the future, this was going to get much more difficult um, to do this kind of tracking due to uh, some technical changes that were happening in the landscape. About six months later, there was unfortunately another um, incident. This one uh, was, in, this killer was inspired by the first one. This was in uh, Germany. And this killer also live streamed um, his event and uh, his crimes and posted those on completely different social media platforms. Um, there was also a, a manifesto there, but what I did in this case was um, try to add a, a, a visual component to the tracking. So instead of just watching the video artifact as it moved, this time I attempted in, in a very simplistic way, you can see on the right hand side, um, a very simplistic diagram that I tried to make uh, showing how this video um, artifact moved through a social media platform called Telegram. So it started, at least in English speaking Telegram, but it started on two source channels and then um, spread in about half an hour to over 15,000 um, different viewers. So um, this was the first attempt, I think, that I had, at least for me, of making um, a, a, a breaking news event with an artifact spreading like that across social media. So it was, it was an um, unfortunate but interesting experience. The next thing I wanted to talk about was financial um, gaming the system, if you will, or financial platform exploitation. So in this case, we're interested in how bad actors are earning money online. And again, this is those, um, particularly those REMV bad actors. We're also interested in um, whether that uh, differs by format. So if they're taking donations on a platform versus if they're actually selling things. We're all in also interested in the technical features of the platforms that encourage financial exploitation. So are there things that the platforms actually, are there features that the platforms actually have that encourage um, exploitation of it by these, by these bad actors? And then what can we do, of course, to stop 
financial exploitation. So this is a space that I work in um, quite a bit. I'm just going to share one of my projects uh, with you right now. It is um, a brand new study of a platform called DLive. And this is a video streaming platform. It's kind of on the smaller side compared to you know, other alternatives you might have heard of like Twitch or YouTube. But what DLive does is it allows people to stream their activities online. And usually that's playing a game or just talking, watching a video, what have you. You can see on the screen here that people are watching each other play Minecraft or Roblox or Grand Theft Auto or some you know, video game or whatever. And DLive is also interesting because it has um, a cryptocurrency that it allows um, people to donate funds to the pe person streaming or the streamer can actually donate um, portions back to the audience. So um, I was curious how this platform or if this platform was being used by some of these bad actors to financially support themselves. And I began collecting data on this person in particular, his name is Nick Fuentes and he runs a group called America First. Um, he is a white nationalist and is using the DLive platform. And I noticed that he was collecting quite a bit of money. Um, so I was curious about that. So I wrote some software to begin collecting the data on this individual back in June and eventually expanded the data collection to um, include 70, almost 75 other uh, similar characters using this platform to make money and started collecting the data. And there's a whole lot of it. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I won't bore you with the details of that. But at the end of the day, it looks like um, Nick in particular is one of the highest, if not the highest earner on this platform, pulling in about $340, $350 a day, which is about $10,000 a month, which is a pretty significant um, amount of money for someone to, uh, to be pulling in um, to share you know, uh, racist and, and white nationalist ideas on this platform. I'm not currently aware of whether the platform knows about this use of it. So um, part of the campaign will be after the data is collected and analyzed will be um, will be a campaign to actually um, educate the platform about how it is being used in case they do not know. And then hopefully um, asking them to take some action in either demonetizing this person, actually this whole squad of people, to be honest, um, or removing them from the platform entirely. The third class of um, bad actor, I guess, activities that we'll talk about is um, harassment campaigns. So one of the favorite activities of these guys is harassing other users online. And we're particularly interested in how that looks and if it's different when a, a racially and ethnically motivated bad actor um, does a harassment campaign as opposed to, you know, a, just a fight online with, you know, say your neighbor or um, someone that you ran across that you don't actually know or have um, animus against. And we're curious if that differs by format. So when someone harasses in um, comments, is that different than if they start their own post? Does the, does the text differ? Does, is it more vitriolic, et cetera? We're also interested in the technical features of the platform as always. Um, what, what kind of features are they exploiting specifically? And then we're, of course, interested in effective strategies for stopping harassment and reducing its effectiveness, reducing its um, reach. So I'm going to show you a couple of characters uh, to help us get in the mindset of someone who does these kind of harassing campaigns online and why they would, why they would do that. On the screen is someone named Milo Yiannopoulos, and he has been deplatformed from so many places. <laughs> I think he's... He's um, he, talking here on a tel um, Telegram. He's been taken off of Twitter and, and Facebook and all the sort of more uh, mainstream websites. Um, but here he is talking on Telegram about how he's bored there. And he's bored on Gab and on Parler and these other sort of niche sites. And he says, there's no one to fight with. Um, I want to fight liberals. That's what I'm good at. That's what I'm the best in the world at. And I'm just so sick of the echo chamber. So he's been removed from normal sites and is now um, relegated to the sort of bottom feeder, but misses misses the harassment opportunities that are presented by sites like Twitter. Uh, this is a white nationalist from the U.S. named Matt Parrott. He is talking here um, uh, uh, about on Twitter. Actually, he's still on Twitter, but he's um, saying he's really thankful that Jack from that's the Twitter founder 
lets me on his website because sometimes I really miss family and the local trolling that only Facebook delivers. So he's been removed um, from Facebook, but misses the opportunity to troll and harass other users on that platform. This is uh, Patrick Casey. He's a leader of a group called American Identity Movement. They used to be called Identity Europa. And he's here being platformed, unfortunately, by the Today Show, which is a large uh, morning news show in the United States. And they gave him at least, I think it was a 10 minute interview, but anyway, it's for spreading his terrible ideas. But um, here he is talking on Telegram about a 12 hour live stream that he's going to be um, hosting on, you guessed it, D Live. You can see the address down there at the bottom. But he's going to do a few hours of video gaming and a game called Skyrim. And he's going to have some discussion, a debate review. This was just a couple weeks ago during the uh, pr uh, first presidential debate. And then from 5 p.m. onward, he's going to do something called Discord rating. So, what this refers to is he's going to get a bunch of himself and his followers to go onto yet another platform called Discord, which is like a chat. Um, a chat and voice platform for people who are playing video games. And he's going to find different channels on there that look um, vulnerable. And he's going to harass uh, the users and basically storm their channel and fill it with Nazi propaganda and basically make it unusable. And this is a, this is a daily activity for these people. So harassment campaigns um, sometimes target individuals, but a lot of times they're more random like this and they just um, will attack an entire platform or an entire group of people trying to use a platform. So we clearly have a problem um, with harassment, both from the, the mindset of the people doing it, but also, you know, it just, it's, it can be cross platform. It can be intra, intra and inter platform um, problem. I attempted to study this in a bunch of different ways. This is a diagram that I made um, charting the, the path of a harassment campaign that began on Facebook and traveled through different Facebook pages, picking up um, <laughs> tons of angry uh, reactions along the way, upwards of 80, 90% of the reactions on this harassment campaign were negative and directed um, at a particular individual. At the end of the campaign, you can see down at the bottom, it actually jumped off of Facebook and onto Twitter, Telegram, and then eventually even to the person's home. So collecting this data is very challenging. Um, especially when we're jumping from platform to platform and trying to track um, a harassment campaign and its reactions. So the tools um, that the platform companies give are sometimes not the, not the best. I had to use um, several different ones and write my own custom software in order to do this tracking. Some of the artifacts that I pick up along the way in studying a campaign like this would be when the, well, what the standards are for when the platforms remove content. So if a person is being harassed and then you go to report the harassment, what, what content will actually have a chance of getting removed. Here on the screen, you see two examples of uh, harassing comments that were made to the same person and the same day in the same harassment campaign. Um, one of them, the one on the left was removed by Facebook. The other one was not. <laughs> they basically read the same um, in English. So it's very difficult to determine as the end user or the person being harassed what um, what the difference is between these two comments but um, so it can be it can be very frustrating for users to be caught in this environment where um, they're not they're not sure why their their own harassment is um, is being uh, supported almost by the platforms so what I want to leave with is a series of, of uh, suggestions based on my research for what platforms can do about this kind of harassment, sort of the propaganda harassment, the financial um, exploitation, and then the, the actual um, harassment campaigns themselves. The first thing that platforms can do is develop community standards. So many countries have uh, rulings about what kind of content is or is not allowed on the platforms when um, there's a gap between the law and, and the, um, you know, what the platform allows, community standards usually step in. And this differs you know, by platform and it differs in each country, but all platforms could probably agree that public standards, you know, putting those, um, those lists of what are the rules are for this platform, making those public are, are very important. Um, those should also be transparent and there should be a history available for the standards and how they change over time. So if all of a sudden there's a new set of rules 
um, the old rules should should also be kept um, around so that we can see how the rules have changed. What you don't want to do is what I've shown here on the bottom. This is a piece of the terms of service from a website called Clout Hub. Um, they claim to be like a free speech type platform, but they didn't want to make community standards. They, they thought that was just too much. So what they did instead was just put up a word list <laughs> of words and phrases you're not allowed to say on the platform. Um, and you can click the little PDF there and read the words that you're not allowed to say and then figure out different words that say the same thing um, just to get around their, uh, their rules. So this would be what I would consider maybe a, a less effective um, uh, standard. Another thing that platforms can do is they can create better reporting tools. So this is particularly important in the case of harassment campaigns, but also would apply to um, to the spread of propaganda and files, um, things like that, that we don't want to see on the platforms. They can um, provide logging tools so that people that report uh, harassment or other uh, bad content can actually see what happens to the content. They can provide follow-ups, so it doesn't just your report doesn't just go into a you know a, a bin somewhere, but you should actually be able to see what happened. You should be able to search the site in a robust sort of way for. Um, keywords and, and information that's being said about each individual person. And it should take a low number of clicks to report. I think right now on Facebook, it, uh, it takes upwards of 10 clicks to report content in some cases. That's way too many clicks, especially if you're being um, bombarded with you know hundreds or thousands of, of harassing comments. And then the tool, the platforms should include multiple categories for the harassment. So we want to see not just terrorism or child exploitation material, but also scams, um, harassment, and so on. Make sure that that's there's lots of different categories um, of bad content. Unfortunately, what we don't want to do in this space is what's shown on the bottom of the screen. Um, this is a message that I actually got from Facebook one time when I tried to report a. Ku Klux Klan group that was operating on the site. And instead of just taking my report, Facebook was testing out, I guess, this feature where they would ask me to um, open a conversation in Messenger with, <laughs> with the group that I was having a problem with. And we would actually you know, have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion. So um, not, not super helpful to suggest that someone have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion with a domestic terror organization. <laughs> so um, thankfully, I think Facebook has, has stopped um, this particular test, but for a while, this was um, a rather unhelpful uh, suggestion. Another thing that platforms can do, and this one's near and dear to my heart because I am a, um, a researcher, is pr prioritize expertise when determining what content should remain or how to tackle um, platform exploitation. Reaching out to domain experts proactively, the people who really know this space, um, really you know, work on this space every day and can provide true expertise about what these different groups are and then providing data access for reach researchers so that we can um, be that third party um, sort of checks and balances, I guess, on their systems. What we don't wanna do in this space is what you see down at the bottom. Again, I hate to pick on Facebook today, but um, this was a case where Facebook provide, said they were going to provide research data um, and they actually did not um, to the point that fund, the people funding grants for the, for the uh, data programs actually decided to to pull out of the project. Um, there's many steps that the platforms can do as far as taking action on the actual content. So whether it's a manifesto or a video or um, person who's you know making way too much money on a site or what have you. This can include things like covering over content, providing warnings and interstitials, slowing down um, actions from a particular user to make the platform unusable. That sometimes works in certain cases. Shadow banning, where the person thinks that they're talking, but that their messages aren't actually getting seen by anyone. Demonetization, which refers to um, removing a person's ability to make money off of a site. This is fairly common on sites like YouTube, where um, a person may have access to um, earning super chat money, for example, but then over time they get removed from that privilege. They could still talk on the platform, but they just can't make money off of their hate speech. Um, and then there's finally, there is content removal. I mean, in some cases, like with the, with the manifesto and video, um, it, it is appropriate to actually remove content. Um, sometimes the platforms are sticky about this because it feels to them like censorship, but um, that is, should always be an option in certain cases. 
And then finally, there's also network detection and disruption. So this would be um, strategies that we can use to find entire networks of people operating um, in groups to do, for example, harassment campaigns um, and disrupting those networks by actually removing the people in them. Uh, here's an example on the bottom of the U.S. president. Um, Twitter didn't uh, thought one of the tweets that he had posted last week was harmful, so put a warning on the top of that tweet. So you can still click in and read it, but it's been um, interrupted by a warning. To keep track of all of these different platform um, responses, I create this uh, little quadrant chart. This is kind of more for myself. I don't really put, publish this out, but I guess I'll share it with you. Um, on the, the up and down axis is how big or small the platform is, how mainstream it is. And then on uh, left to right, I keep track of um, how responsive each platform is, how, you know, is there anyone at the helm <laughs> or is it just kind of like a decentralized dark web sort of situation? How responsive is the platform going to be to public pressure or hearing from people like me when I tell them, uh, hey, <laughs> something's going wrong on your system. And then I just plop in the different social media sites where they currently are. So this, they move um, over time. And I, uh, the version of this that I use um, for myself is not on paper. So I can actually, it's little uh, slots of paper. So I can actually move the platforms around as they, um, as they take action against different sites or not. One um, particular example I'm thinking of is Discord, which used to be pretty rough. Um, they, do, they were not super responsive several years ago um, when they had white nationalists and others using their site to plan um, violence, such as what we saw in the uh, 2017 Charlottesville incident. But over this past summer, Discord has become enormously responsive to pu public pressure and to campaigns like mine. So they actually moved up quite a bit on the chart. Um, but yeah, so that's how I track um, how the, the platforms are actually responding to the exploitation, how they're doing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and end here, but if you'd like to put your questions in the chat, um, that'll give me a, give those a second to catch up and I'll leave us on our final screen here. You can see my Twitter down at the bottom. You're welcome to follow that. Um, I'm going to go back to the other tab and see if there's any questions that y'all have and I'll stop, um, stop my screen share so we can look at each other. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm gonna click stage and let's see if there's any questions coming in. Yeah, so here's one. Um, what platform do you find has the best reporting and harassment procedures? So yeah, that's kind of what I'm trying to track on that last, um, last and final slide. There's um, a variety of different ones and they each have different strategies that they use. Um, I used to like Facebook support inbox, but <laughs> Over the past several months, they, I've noticed that messages have gone missing out of my support inbox. So when you report something on Facebook, um, the support inbox is called the, the log where they, uh, there's sort of a record that you reported something. And over the past couple of months, many of the things that I've reported have gone missing from that inbox. And there's also um, like a weird thing where they updated a bunch of them. Um, it's very strange. So I used to say I liked that inbox, but now I'm not so sure what's going on in there. I do like um, Twitter acknowledges that you got a report and allows you to report multiple things at once, which is helpful. It saves on that whole clicking problem that I was talking about. But the problem there is that the reports just kind of go into their system and you don't hear back for months and months and years later. And then, you know, sometimes you even like forget that you reported the person and you get this notice that they were, um, you know, finally took action. So it can be kind of, um, kind of frustrating at times to use. Um, other platforms have a really fast response rate, but they aren't as necessarily obvious about how to do the reporting. You kind of have to know someone. So I would put maybe Discord in this uh, example. If, if you know someone that works there, they're, they're extremely responsive and will take content down or entire networks of people down um, really fast. But the problem is, you know, you have to know someone there. And so that can be frustrating if you're just sort of like, if you stumble across stuff, it can be hard to ask. Um, there was another question about is most focusing on right wing extremists at the moment, or is there much focus on possible left wing? So my specialty area is right wing um, violent extremism. I don't um, 
that's just not my area to study, you know, the both sides or whatever, um, other types of extremism. I also don't do like the jihadist stuff or, um, you know, scams or child exploitation material or any of the other types of, you know, terrible content on the internet. I really just focus on the one area. There's um, w way too much out there to be um, truly an expert on, on more than, than just those areas. So that's where I tend to focus my time. Are there other questions in the chat? I'm seeing a slight delay, but I guess we could give it a, a second or two. Oh, someone's asking if their connection's lagging. I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> I hope it's not lagging. Mine seems fine, but I'm maybe just talking to myself. <laughs> um, we're ask another question is about, do we, do I feel like there's enough action towards the bad actors? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it does feel frustrating that you'll see a lot of the, the mind share in a company being put on um, the, the, the sales side. And, and that kind of makes sense if you think about, you know, it's a business, right? But the problem is if they ignore uh, ignore the bad actors and things that are happening on the platform, if they ignore that, that portion of it, then what you end up with is, um, I like to make the analogy of kind of like a failed state. <laughs> so you have all this attention on one side and then there's people that are completely exploiting the platform and making it basically, um, basically unusable for a sizable portion of users. So we don't wanna see that happen either. Um, I think with, with attention, by putting attention on the issue, um, there will be, um, you know, slow fixes on some platforms, but there are others where it's just been really frustrating to try to get uh, them to take more proactive, more proactive um, measures. Vlad says you mentioned Twitter and Telegram, um, where you can see harassment. Why do they not do anything? Yeah, I think one of the most frustrating for me is Telegram. Um, that platform has uh, just an enormous amount of. Ter absolutely terrible content on it. Um, the reporting is almost non-existent. I've written like whole articles about how bad the, the bad it is to report content on there. You you basically just click a button and there's no record that you ever reported anything. You have no idea what's happening to the to the report. There's no standards written anywhere for reporting. Um, they do claim to take action on jihadist material and on. Um, uh, a couple of other categories of material like scams and stuff like spam and things like that. But it's very hard if you're not in one of those sort of privileged categories, I guess, to get action taken. Um, so the, the sort of white nationalist, white supremacist content is just absolutely <laughs> rife on that platform. So it's very frustrating. The next question was, do you feel social media are progressing in the way that they detect over the past few months and other actions with the presidential election. So a lot of the focus in, especially in the United States right now has been on misinformation and disinformation. And that is a related but separate area, which also needs an enormous amount of attention. There's enough work here for, for everyone <laughs> um, to go around, but the misinformation side is truly, it is important. And it also feeds the right-wing extremism um, side as well. If you think about the idea of a conspiracy theory and the ability to believe in a conspiracy theory. Um, what we find when we're researching the more, um, you know, politically extremist groups is they'll also often be predicated on conspiracy theories. So if you can cut that out at the root, um, you'll often spread or stop the spread of these tendrils of belief. So that is a very important area. Um, questions about data analysis of telegram scams. Yeah, so I actually, with a few colleagues of mine, released a very large data set um, a few months ago of telegram channels um, and all of the content on those. It was, oh gosh, probably 350 million messages on telegram um, centered around just the extremist um, channels. But you could do a similar study with the scams and the, you know, the other, um, types of material on there. Telegram does have a very open platform for data collection, which is nice. It's just that um, there's a lot of bad content on there. So um, the next question was about recruiting and, and rhetoric. Um, yeah, I st and whether it's still possible to for the platforms to be good versus bad. Yeah, there, there's way more good content on these platforms than the bad stuff. It's just that I, I happen to have to focus on the bad parts. So sometimes it seems really overwhelming when I do a talk. I always like laugh that I have to be the, the bearer of such bad news. But 
for the most part, the platforms, they, they are overall still still good and, and better than, um, than they used to be usually in the cases of platform exploitation. One of the things that I'm noticing is when there is an imbalance like that, when it feels like a platform is just being overrun by bad actors, it's usually a newer platform that maybe wasn't anticipating some of this kind of reaction. They don't have um, plans and stuff in place. So um, yeah, so they kind of get surprised a little bit and they don't, they didn't plan ahead. So there's uh, groups like Tech Against Terrorism and others um, that are working, that are available to work with smaller platforms to get them um, sort of up to speed. They actually have a mentoring program where they work with other, um, with these kind of small platforms to teach them how to maybe anticipate how they're going to be abused so that they can um, put in some of the, um, you know, stop gaps that I mentioned at the end of my talk. So, so someone says, you're so brave props for your team. Thank you. I guess we'll leave it on that. That's a very nice compliment and I appreciate it very much. So thank you so much. Yeah. And I, I asked the question because I think uh, as maybe we had spoken about before, I've, I've spoken about with some of the other, uh, some of our other experts um, that come from CAR and CAR is the center of the analysis of the radical right mm -hmm. in that a lot of them focus on the negative sides of platforms and, and how, they, how these platforms can be used uh, from a negative perspective. But a lot of uh, what we like to focus on as well is how these platforms can be used um, to, to counter. So when we talk about counter speech, mm -hmm. Um, encountering misinformation. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of projects out there, both in the US and uh, the EU, really worldwide focusing on that. So um, I, I just always like to end it on a positive note. Yeah, as definitely. you mentioned, there's always this focus on, on the negative side of these platforms. But of course, uh, the work yeah. that we're doing, the work that a lot of you all are doing, and, I'm, and Megan, I'm sure you know a lot of other people that are that are doing tremendous work mm -hmm. um, to, to counter this speech and to counter this, this information. And and uh, yeah, I just really wanted to focus on that. And I agree. I think it's always interesting because all of our speakers are focusing on um, extremist groups. So of course there is inherent danger. Of course, maybe some of you all saw what happened in the US uh, with uh, the plot to um, kidnap, et cetera, et cetera. So um, th thank you for the work that you're doing.